let's see. All right, so we are recording. Let me uh, pull up your exam before I share my screen. Gotcha. First one we're going to look at is exam one. Let's see. All right. Responses. While I'm pulling this up, I'll remind you and anybody watching the video, I know I'm beating a dead horse, but someone's still going to say, oh, I didn't know. The exam is on Monday at 8 o'clock in the morning, all mine. If you miss it, you will get a zero. So don't sleep in. Don't forget, it's it's Monday at 8 a.m. on the yeah, If you need more time to take it, you need to contact me you know, this weekend so we can make arrangements to meet online where I can see your screen and see your face and hear your backgrounds and all that stuff. So anyway. All right, I've got it pulled up. Oops, sorry about that. Let me uh, share it. Exam one. There we go. All right. Gotcha. So, so you can see it now? Uh, yeah. Yep. It's on there. All right. Perfect. Here we go. What is science? Um, this is one of those questions that came directly from the study guide. The simple answer is it is the inquiry based effort to describe and explain nature. Um, the reason what is it that I put? you put all the answers are correct. Oh, um, okay. Okay. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a tricky question, but again, I didn't write it. It came directly from the study guide. You know, it's the search gotcha. for truth. The reason it's not the search for truth is because the word truth is very subjective, right? Like truth is not facts, right? Um, it's that, yeah. that's too subjective. And even though there are ethical and moral boundaries to science, science itself is not that, right? You could, you could technically perform science unethically and unmorally, but so, yeah, so science is just the inquiry based effort to describe and explain nature. Um, and I'll remind you guys, or you and anybody watching the video, um, when I write exams using the study guides, usually I change the wordings, right? So I always gotcha. say, I always say when you're studying the study guides, don't study them, don't memorize them exactly as they're written because they'll, they'll change. But when you're studying the first three exams, studying for the final, you can uh, memorize, you can memorize these just as they're written because I'm not going to reword the first three exams. Oh, okay, cool. All right. Let's see. Next, you try to watch Stranger Things on your smartphone, but your phone won't turn on. Which of the following is a prediction? So at least yours, you got partial credit for this because at least yours was part of the scientific method, but yours was the observation, right? The observation is, hey, the battery's dead. Or excuse me. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The observation is my phone won't turn on. The question is, why won't my phone turn on? You gotcha. chose, and you chose the hypothesis that my battery yeah. is dead. And remember, it's a very important distinction between hypothesis and prediction. Yeah, that was just me trying to be fast. Okay. Um, and just to make sure, I'm gonna. I know it's gonna take a while, but I want to make sure you've learned it, and not just knowing the answers for the exam. But mm -hmm. The hypothesis, you know, you have your hypothesis and then the prediction is usually an if then statement that describes how you're going to test your hypothesis. So if, you're yeah. hypothesis, if your hypothesis is the battery is dead, then you could say, well, if I plug it in, then it will turn on. Right. Or and you could have you could have other predictions like if I charge it, it will turn on so on and so forth. All right. You try to watch the uh, same thing. Now we're acting for the hypothesis. So that's good. You just and again, you got partial credit for this because you just. Yeah. See, you just mixed up your hypotheses and your predictions. Gotcha. Okay. Choose the most correct statement. Hypotheses are less comprehensive than theory than theories. That is actually true. And the way it was written mm -hmm. in the study guide was that theories are more comprehensive than hypotheses, right? So it says the same thing, just in different words. Okay. Um, and you chose hypotheses are educated guesses and theories are tentative explanations. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mentioned that in the um, in the lecture. A lot of people think that a hypothesis is an educated guess, and that's not necessarily true. But more importantly, this one is really not true. Theories are tentative explanations, and that's not true, right? Gotcha. Okay. Um, but then someone would have had. Let's see. Yeah. Anyway. anyway. Moving forward. All right. Adjacent water molecules interact with each other via which bonds. So there's only, and you could have gotten partial credit, um, but because the only three bonds we talked about were hydrogen bonds, covalent bonds, and ionic bonds. Obviously, the answer mm -hmm. is hydrogen bonds. But had you chose any of the other two, you would have at least had partial credit. But polar, gotcha. bonds, polar bonds doesn't exist. Um, 
we did talk about polar molecules that result in hydrogen bonds. So I see where you're coming from, but that's why you didn't okay. get any credit for that. Yeah, I, I, I must have just mixed those up. Your cells are mostly how much water? And this is just one of those things you just had to memorize. Um, and this is 70 to 95 percent. There's not much else to say about that. Um, gotcha. What happens when water freezes? Um, so basically, you know, when water freezes, it floats, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason it floats is because it becomes less dense. So then knowing that it becomes less dense, then you look at the options to see if any of those match. And that would be this. They, they mm -hmm. become less dense because the molecules increase the distance between them, right? That they get bigger, yeah, yeah. It makes them less dense, um, which is why you you chose the opposite. Mm -hmm. All right, a base. So there's so many ways to describe this. Actually, I won't even go through it because again, you can study the old exams verbatim. You don't need to worry about me rechanging the words. But a base increases the pH of a solution, right? Uh, what what was it I picked? I can't. Resist changes in pH. So that would be okay. a, a buffer. Gotcha. So your answer would be a buffer. Um, let's see. So if somebody chose decreases the pH of a solution, they would have at least gotten partial credit because, you know, they're on the right track. Anybody mm -hmm. who chose what you chose or, um, yeah, anyway. Yeah, so the correct answer, a base increases the pH. And, again, an acid decreases the pH. And, uh, again, you chose gotcha. resist changes and again that would be a buffer all right relative to a ph of four ph of seven so the first thing we need to know before we even look into the options is think about this if we're going from four to seven that means we're getting more basic which means there's going to be less h plus ions or more oh minus ions depending on how you look at it so um you let's see the answer is 1000 times lower H plus concentration, because again, when you go each step is um, 10 times, right? So four to five is 10. Yeah. Five to six will be a hundred, six to seven will be a thousand. So there's a thousand difference between four and seven, which is why these two aren't even an option. And again, when you're getting basic, that means you're going to have a lower, a lower H plus concentration. Gotcha. All right. Oh, and I hope I should have said this before we started. Hopefully you have something to write down, write these down with. Because yeah. right. my suggestion is to study these, you know, memorize them, put them on the back of a, uh, a flashcard or something. But these, these are the ones you can memorize. All right. RNA and DNA are a lot alike, um, but they're different. How are they different? It looks like you're on the right track, except you got them switched. So RNA is uh, stranded. DNA is double stranded. Gotcha. Of course, way back when, when we did exam one, that was an easier mistake to make. But now that we've talked about it in chapter 10, hopefully no one makes that mistake. Yeah. Um, you just got back from vacation. You found some, some odd thing on the beach. Below is a list of characteristics to describe it. Which of the following is not an indication that the odd thing is live? So basically this is saying, here's a list of, um, here's a list of the properties of life. Which one of these is not a property of life? And being made of cells is a property of life. Yeah. Growing is a property of life. Maintaining your temperature, you know, is a property of life. The only thing that's not necessarily a property of life is that it moves. So that's why that is the correct answer. Gotcha. And then the extra credit, and I'll take this time to remind everybody watching the video. I said for the first three exams, I kept saying, like, hey, you really should watch this exam review. Because in the exam review, I said something like, at the end of the exam, end of the exam, there's going to be an extra credit question, and the question is going to make no sense. And the answer is this, right? So, like, this doesn't make sense. If you were to multiply a bog monster by a flute, your colors would melt. This is contrary. See, to that's why I was always confused with those. I that's why I kept saying. That makes I, sense now. Okay, yeah. You know, even after exam one, I said, after exam one, I said, I even talked about this. I said, there's an extra credit question, and had you watched the exam review video, I told you the answer. And then the same thing happened for exam two. We did exam two. Hardly anybody watched the review. And then after exam two, I said, had you watched yeah. the video, you would have had the 10% bump. Would have got it. Yep. Yeah. All right. So that's it for exam one for the questions you missed. Do you have any other questions before we move on to exam uh, two? I don't. I think the ones I missed, were, I just either uh, they were the opposite or I was going a little too fast. <laughs> Excuse me. That and didn't read it all. That will happen. And as I pull up exam two, 
that's a good time for me to remind you and everybody else, even though I just said it at the beginning of the video, you know, it is hard when you're getting rushed. So if you need more time to take the exam, you need to contact me sometime before Sunday so we can find a time to meet online. And as long as I can ensure that you are taking a closed book exam, then I don't mind extending the time for you. All right, pulled it up. I'm waiting on it to load up with your responses. And then once I have that, I will share the video. Gotcha. Or share the screen. Um, for anybody watching the video, if you want some extra credit or some independent work points for watching it what in the world, send me an email saying that you watched it and tell me who uh, who you're who who I'm talking to. You can see on the screen the name of the person I'm talking to. First name only. All right. And then I will give you like one point of independent work. Let's see. Come on. Sorry, my computer's really slow. Oh, uh, no problem. And while I'm waiting for this to load, I'll remind you uh, when we're done with this, please send me an email to remind me that we reviewed this so I can gotcha. So I can give you the, the extra credit, the boost to your grade. All righty. And just so I have a paper trail, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right. So let's see. I think I see it now. Yep. And you only took this one once, right? You didn't retake it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sadly, should have retaken it. All right. So now I can show my screen. And here we go. Oh, this one made me sad. A lot of some a lot of people miss this one. Um, this one is the biggest one. This is the most important. This before you even get into the details of photosynthesis and respiration and all the different stages, the most basic thing you should know is that photosynthesis uses glucose and oxygen. I'm excuse me, respiration uses uh, glucose and oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water, while Photosynthesis uses carbon dioxide and water to produce glucose and oxygen. That's the, the most basic. So if anybody's watching this, uh -huh. please, please, please don't miss that question. Like, that's the biggest thing. Um, that's so important. Like, before you even worry about the details of glycolysis versus electron transport chain versus citric acid cycle, if you don't know that, like, that's the most important. Um, anyway, in respiration, which one produces ATP? You got partial credit. The answer is they all produce ATP, right? Mm. All three produce ATP. The gotcha. one, and electron transport chain produces the most. But anyway, they all three, so that's why you got partial credit. Um, anyway, which produces the most ATP? Like I just said, the answer is electron transport chain. So remember, the first two stages are all stripping away those high-energy electrons from the glucose. And then those high energy electrons are put to use in electron transport chain. And that's where you make the most ATP. Mm. Um, which of these happens in the mitochondria? The correct answer is citric acid cycle and electron transport chain. So had you chosen citric acid cycle or electron transport chain, you would have had partial credit, but you chose all three. So that's why there was no credit for that one. Mm. All right. So remember, another way of saying that is the only one that happens outside of the mitochondria is glycolysis. The other two okay. happen inside. Now, this one, you 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 are going to switch up the wording, right? Oh, yeah. Good reminder. Yeah, I won't switch okay. up the wording. So, yeah, I guess oh, I, you are. Okay. I will not. Right. This, all three exams, I will take the questions as they're written and put them directly into the final. Gotcha. So before the exam, you can study them exactly as they're written. The only thing that's going to change is all these things are on shuffle. So, like, same okay. thing. so like right now, which directly uses oxygen? The answer is electron transport chain. But um, it'll be flipped and all that. Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah, okay. All right. Which directly produces carbon dioxide? The answer is citric acid cycle. Um, like I said a few times in the lecture, whether we're talking about photosynthesis or respiration, it's the C's. Anything that de deals with carbon dioxide is a cycle. Citric mm -hmm. acid cycle, carbon dioxide, Calvin cycle. That's all the C's. That's why I called it the citric acid cycle instead of the Kelvin cycle. Because that was the hint. All those C's. I see. Okay. Yeah. So when you whether you're talking about carbon di or photosynthesis or respiration, if it's if it's carbon dioxide, you should think of a cycle. All right. Respiration, which directly produces water, and the answer is simply the electron transport chain. 
um, because when the oxygen accepts those electrons, that produces water. There's not much to say about that one. Yeah. Um, which pumps hydrogen ions against a concentration gradient? The answer is electron transport chain. Because like I said earlier, the first two, it's all about stripping away the high-energy electrons. And then finally, in the electron transport chain, they are put to use by pumping ion hydrogen ions against a concentration gradient. Um, had you chosen uh, citric acid cycle and electron transport chain, you would have been half right. So you would have had half credit. Yeah. All right. Um, respiration, which uses hydrogen ions going down the concentration gradient. So that goes along with this, right? This one uh, yeah. pumps it against. Therefore, also, it would have been electron transport chain only. Um, and if I'm going too fast, let me know. Slow me down. On oh, you're good. You're good. Okay. Which uses ATP synthase? The simple answer is just electron transport chain. And again, had you chosen uh, citric acid and electron transport chain, that would have been partial credit. Um, which strips away high energy electrons? Like I said earlier, it's glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. So had you mm. had you chosen glycolysis or the citric acid cycle, that would have been partial credit. And obviously, had you chosen both, that would have been full credit. Yeah, but, yeah. but electron transport chains uses those electrons. That's why you didn't get any credit for that. All right. In respiration, high energy electrons come from the glucose. So A is glucose. They're ultimately accepted by the oxygen. So B is oxygen. And then it forms a molecule of water. So C is water. I, well, what order did I have? Uh, oxygen, ATP, and glucose. So ATP, even though that was one of the one of the options, really the only three words you should use are glucose, oxygen, and water. Actually, and now that I'm looking at it, they were in that order. But Yeah. <laughs> Um, and photo, so this is the opposite. Now we're talking about photosynthesis and photosynthesis electrons come from the water. So water would be a, which then forms a molecule of oxygen. So B should be oxygen. And then those electrons are eventually excited and then incorporated into a molecule of glucose. So the answer is C. And we, you know, that's again, big picture stuff. I was talking about that during the lecture, like big picture. This is where the electrons come from. This is where they go. Gotcha. All right. Sometimes cells undergo anaerobic respiration in a process called what? And the answer is just fermentation. Not much else to say about that. When they're doing uh -huh. respiration without oxygen, it's called fermentation. And, uh, photosynthesis, which stage? Oh, this is unfortunate. So the answer is for all the photosynthesis questions, the only correct answers are either going to be light reactions or Calvin cycle. So anybody who guessed, even if you got it wrong, as long as you got one of those two, you would get partial credit. Mm. Um, but anyway, in photosynthesis, it is the Calvin cycle that uses the ATP because it needs that energy to build the, the glucose molecule. To build, yeah, okay. So to help you remember, whenever we're talking about harvesting energy for photosynthesis, it's light reactions. Whenever we're talking about using energy to build glucose, it's the Calvin cycle. Calvin cycle, gotcha. All right, photosynthesis, which produces oxygen. That's a little bit trickier, but the answer is light reactions. And again... Glycolysis isn't even in photosynthesis. That's that's, yeah. why, that's why you didn't get any credit. But if, as long as you guess one of those two, you at least get partial credit. Um, which uses water? Again, um, that kind of goes with the last one because it says which produces oxygen, right? So the light reactions, that's water gives up the electrons and that becomes a molecule of oxygen. So again, partial credit as long as you get one of those two, but glycolysis is not a part of photosynthesis. Okay. Um, same thing here. Photosynthesis, which uses high energy electrons. So again, it's the Calvin cycle that's using the energy. Light reactions are harvesting the energy. Calvin cycle is using it. And glycolysis is a part of respiration. Photosynthesis, which directly uses chlorophyll. I was hoping the hint here is chlorophyll. Remember, that's a pigment. It's all about lights, right? So yeah, yeah. light reaction. Um, photosynthesis, which directly produces glucose. Um, again, Calvin's uh, light reactions are all about harvesting the energy. Calvin cycle uses that energy to produce glucose. So the answer is Calvin cycle. Uh, photosynthesis, which directly uses carbon dioxide. Same here, right? To build that glucose, that C6H12O6, it needs carbon. And it gets it from the carbon dioxide. So Calvin cycle is the thing that uses carbon dioxide. Yeah, to build up. Yeah. And mitosis is not 
you know, photosynthesis or respiration. Um, this exam is essentially covers one property of life. So here we keep talking about energy and ATP and high energy electrons, energy, energy, energy. The answer is energy. Is there any questions about that one? No, that one, that's straightforward. Okay. All energy requires life. What do all cells directly use as a source of energy? And the answer is ATP. Um, you got partial yeah. credit. Okay, I was about to say the sun is that that's not all the way wrong. Right. But yeah, your cells don't directly use the sun, right? Especially you and yeah, me. Yeah. We don't use the sun at all directly. Yeah. But because the had this said ultimately, uh, where do the cell where does the energy ultimately come from? The answer would be the sun. So the people who got partial credit are the people that guessed the sun, because this energy does ultimately come from the sun. And the people who guess glucose, because we use glucose to make ATP. So ATP is the correct answer. Those other two, you would get partial credit. And anybody who gets electricity, coal, or caffeine just got zero credit. And some people did do that. Um, so for the f for the for weeks, I kept saying, I kept telling everybody, make sure you study this. Make sure you study the syllabus. Read the syllabus. That was the first assignment. Um, the reason being is because I said there was going to be a couple questions about it on the exam. So here it is. Independent work is worth a thousand points. How much is the whole uh, course worth? And the answer is a thousand. Mm. And here's another thing, and I'll say it now because it's too late. Had you read the syllabus, there's a sentence in there that says, if you read this, meet me in office hours and show me you read it for extra credit. And I think three people got that. Uh, here we go. There are three beakers, each beaker. Okay. That's hard to say without talking about this too much and wasting too much of your time. Basically, there was a question like this on the study guide, and I think you and the last person I talked to simply just got it switched. So what we're doing, uh, we're comparing the beaker to the balloon, not the balloon to the beaker. So, you know, I wish I could draw on my screen, but all the beakers have a 20% 20, 20 solution, right? So let's just look at balloon A for one example and then move forward. Beaker A has a 10%. So you have a 10% inside of a 20%. The beaker is 20. That means the beaker has a higher percentage than the balloon. Therefore, the beaker, the solution is hypertonic to the balloon. Mm. So probably, again, just like the last person, you probably just got them flopped. Just picked up, yeah. We're, to, we're comparing the beaker to the balloon, not the balloon to the beaker. Sort of like my brother who's taller than I am. You could say, Vasilios is shorter than Chris. Or you could say Chris is taller than Vasilio. So it depends, you know, are you comparing him to me or are you comparing me to him? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. When you eat food, uh, that energy is put to work in your cells. However, not all of it is for work. What happens to the rest? And the answer is it is released as heat. Because as we learned, when you switch, um, when you go from one form of energy to the other, you lose heat. But you'll notice you did get partial credit. Because when that energy is put to work in the cells, it is actually making ATP, right? Oh, so, uh, okay. So you weren't way off. It's just we were talking about the energy that wasn't used to store ATP. What happened to the rest of it? It was released as heat. But again, you, gotcha. got, you got partial credit because, you know, you were on the right track. Now, this is just one of those numbers you needed to know. And I remember saying in the lecture, like, I don't require you to know many numbers, but this is one of them. Uh, we put 34% of that energy to work. Mm. Um, which color of light is the best for photosynthesis? Um, and a lot of people got this wrong, but at least you're on the right track because blue is high energy. This is one yeah. that doesn't have partial. The, the, the answer is white. Because remember, from the lab, white is all the colors. White is green, red, blue. Yeah, oh, that, it, yeah. yeah, it's all the colors mixed together. Because it reflects them, right? Yeah. Well, gotcha. Or puts them off, I guess you'd say. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, that's that. And then again, there's another one of those weird, uh, one of those weird extra credit ones where I give you the the word in the exam review video. So that's it for exam two. Any questions about exam two? I don't think so. All right, let me stop sharing this. Close out of this, and I'll pull up exam three. While I'm waiting for that, I will say for anybody watching the video, like I said. I told you how to get one <laughs> earlier. If you want to get another point of independent work for those watching the video, send me a screenshot 
and I'll tell you when, not yet. But when you send me that first email, also that includes his name, also send me a screenshot of, let's see, not yet, not yet. My computer is extra slow. There we go. You can send me a screenshot of, let's see, whoops, good group. Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay. A screenshot of this, just to prove that you're watching. For those of you watching the video, Matt, you're good. You're going to get points a different way. You're going to get many more points. So, Gotcha. Anyway, moving forward. So this first one, you know, I just made up the species name. That part doesn't matter. So I'm just going to focus on the words that matter here. We cross something that was, we cross something that's blue with something uh, that's yellow, right? And then the result was everything was yellow, right? Forget all the other stuff. Forget the fact that the teeth or this thing called a corn cuddle, that doesn't matter. We, we crossed a blue thing and a yellow thing and all the offspring were yellow. So that means the yellow allele, allele is dominant to the blue allele. And that's it. Gotcha. And notice you got partial credit. Anybody who guessed any of these other than... <laughs> I just threw this in there, like prophase and mitosis. That has nothing to do with this. So as long as you didn't guess that completely off the wall answer, you would have gotten partial credit, as you did. So yeah, um, again, you mix yellow and blue. One hundred percent of the offspring were yellow. That must mean yellow was dominant to blue. Gotcha. All right, moving forward, a similar question, but let's just focus on the, the words that matter. The rest of it doesn't matter. We crossed red with blue this time. And we ended up with some purple, right? So when you that means we're blending the phen phenotypes, which means the answer is incompletely dominant. Uh -huh. So when you blend phenotypes, it's incomplete dominance. Um, and again, as long as you didn't guess this one, I made this up. The offspring represent the F2 generation of independent variation. I just put a bunch of words together. So as long as you didn't guess that, you got partial credit as you did. Okay. Um, again, same thing. Let's just focus on the words that matter here. We crossed something blue with something yellow, and the result were blue with yellow spots. And that means both of the phenotypes are showing up. It's not blending, but both of the phenotypes are showing up, and the answer is co-dominant. What was it that I put? I can't see that. Um, you put that the spotted allele is dominant to the blue and yellow alleles. Which at least is which is at least is logical, even though you know, you know. But the idea here is that again, when you have both of the parental phenotypes showing up, that means it's codominance. And again, here on this last one, I just made some stuff up. So as long as you didn't choose the completely wrong off the wall answer, like you did not, you would get partial credit. So you got partial credit because you didn't choose the crazy answer. Gotcha. Um, the law of segregation basically state what states what. And the answer is that there's only one allele for a given gene that segregates into each gamete. Um, and you got partial credit because it, it kind of makes sense. Um, but anyway, yeah, so the correct answer is only one yeah, allele for a given I gene. I thought that was right. Yeah, it, it's logical. I mean, it's not right, but at least it's logical. I got you. But yeah. Um, not having freckles is recessive to having freckles. What is the genotypic ratio expected when an individual without freckles mates with an individual heterozygous for freckles? So you would have to do a Punnett square. And um, I would show you, but really I don't want to waste your time. So the answer gotcha. is one to one. So had you done a Punnett square, you would realize this is the correct answer. But on, unfortunately, you fell for one of the traps. Uh, so... As long as you got one of these, it would have been partial credit. But you chose one of these; it just you really don't go. Nothing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's the the correct answer is one to one or two to two. Um, and again, if you guess the least, the other ones make sense because I said you'd have well, ask for a ratio, and these other two are words, not ratios. But all right, all right, here we go. Another one of these weird up made weird name things that I made up. Um, so here we have. The presence of the presence or absence of spikes is controlled by a single gene. Oh, 
all that is just useless information, right? Here's what it's asking. Basically, which of these genotypes is heterozygous? That's it. That's all this is asking. So the answer is big S, little s, right? Mm. They have homozygous, yeah. homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and homozygous recessive. And the answer is big S, little s. And unfortunately, again, I think you fell for the trap. So had you chosen any of the other two phenotype, genotypes, you would have had partial credit. But you chose the one that was uh, the, the throwaway one. So there was zero credit for that. All right. Um, here's one of those that you get partial credit. It's the wild type. The wild type is found most in nature. Um, but at least I could see why someone would think the dominant trait, which is why you got two out of three points. Anybody, gotcha. anybody who guessed recessive trait would have had one out of the three. And anybody who guessed these words that I made up, which are ionic, chromatid, and bookshelves, which have nothing, that's just craziness. Anybody who guessed those would get zero credit, which is a good time to remind anybody watching this video, if you barely pass this exam, you should know that probably you actually failed it. But, you know, with, with questions like this where you're getting partial credit, that really boosted a lot of people's grades. But anyway, now we're talking about, um, here we go. We'll see. Let's just cut to the important stuff here instead of talking about Marfan syndrome. Oh, yeah, here we go. The key here, it's not that I expect anybody to know anything about Marfan syndrome, but I said anybody who with Marfan syndrome is lanky, has both heart and eye problems. So basically they've got this one gene and they have all these different phenotypes. So that is, uh, and it, that means it's pleiotropy. So what type of inheritance? And the answer is pleiotropy. Gotcha. Now, had anybody guessed co-dominance or incomplete dominance, they would have had partial credit because at least we talked about those. Um, but heterozygous recessive, that's impossible, right? Because yeah. yeah, you're either heterozygous is both dominant and recessive. You know, you have both dominant allele and recessive allele. So unfortunately, you got zero credit for that one instead of partial. Um, what is the key to recognizing a trait whose expression is determined by the effects of two or more genes? This is polygenic inheritance. Just simply put, like I said in the uh, lecture, there would be a bell curve, right? So um, if you were to graph the phenotypes of a population, you would get a bell curve. And the example we used in lecture was height, right? So there's a lot of medium-sized people, and there's very few shorter people and very few taller people. Oh, okay. yeah, I remember that. And had you guessed... Any of the other ones, you would have gotten partial credit, but unfortunately, I trapped you with one of the non. -stop. Yeah, gotcha. Um, this one is a little bit more complicated. Assume the ability to shoot spider webs from your wrist is inherited as a sex link from sets of trait. All right. So the last video I did with somebody else, I explained this answer. And uh, to save time, I'm just going to give you the answer: is if the woman that he mates with can also shoot webs from her wrist, then there's a hundred percent chance that the daughter could do it too. So. Just to, just to get the answer for that, that's the answer. Okay. But if you want to learn about it, then you can watch the other video that I'm going to post later. Gotcha. I explained why that's the right answer. Um, if one strand of D. Okay, so this one turned out to be a mistake, a typo. So you can see it's worth zero points. So I won't even talk about it because there is no correct answer because I accidentally did the wrong one. Okay. But you didn't lose points for that. You didn't lose points. You didn't gain points. That was just neutral. And obviously that question will not be on the final exam because there's a problem. Gotcha. All right. So this question is about splicing, right? So when the mRNA goes through splicing, there's parts that are removed and parts that stay in. So which parts are removed? The answer is introns. So remember, when we're talking about splicing, there's only introns and exons. So the only real acceptable answers are one of those two, introns or exons. Gotcha. And exons are the parts that stay in because they're the parts that are expressed. Introns are the parts that are in between, and that's why they're removed. So that's why introns is the correct answer. And again, had you chosen one of those two, you would have had partial credit. But chromosomes is not one of those uh, zero credit. Um, assume you can buy kits that allow regular people to produce proteins in everyday cookware via a process they call at-home bioterrorism. These kits only utilize translation, not transcription. Which of the following component is not needed? Um, so DNA is the only thing that's not needed, right? So basically, you, list, you look at this list. Another way of asking this question is, which of these things is not directly needed for translation, right? You need ribosomes, you need tRNA, you need mRNA, you need amino acids. 
The only thing you don't directly need, you need mRNA. The only thing you don't directly need is uh, yeah. DNA. I must have read that one wrong because that one's pretty straightforward. Uh, transcribe this trans uh, strand of DNA. So the key word here is transcribe, which means we're making a molecule of RNA. So anything with a T in it is going to be the wrong answer. Um, so any that's why you got a zero. There's like not even partial credit out of the three. But some people guess this, which would be partial credit. That would be two out of the three points because at least if it, you were doing a new strand of DNA, it would be C C A G T T A T T, right? So that would be correct if we weren't talking about transcription. So that, anybody who guessed that got two out of the three points. But the correct answer is this C C U G U U A U U. And I know I said you should you can memorize these, but it'll be easier. It's easier to me just to you know figure out how to do that as opposed to memorize it. Any questions about that one? No, I don't think so. All right. Um, where does transcription start? And really, the only good choices for this would be promoter or start codon, right? That's it. Uh, metaphase has nothing to do with transcription or translation. Uh, the terminator, at least that has something to do with it. And prophase has nothing to do with transcription or translation. Yeah. That's about prophase. So the answer is promoter. But again, you would have had partial credit had you put start codon, because at least that makes sense. Because start codon is where translation starts, not transcription. Um, next, the absence of a terminator will result in what? And the answer is, so a terminator, the first thing you need to know is what a terminator does. And a terminator says, stop transcription. So what happens when you stop transcription? You stop making a molecule of RNA. Therefore, you would get a shorter, what, where is it at? A longer strand of RNA, right? So if you if you get rid of the thing that says stop making RNA, you're going to have a longer strand of RNA. Um, and had you guessed, what is it? Actually, I don't know why that's worth two points, because, yeah, there is no other option. Um, anyway, gotcha. you need amino acids to build proteins, blah, blah, blah. How many... Um, amino acids are there basically and the answer is 20 and again had you guessed anything with numbers on it you would have had partial credit i just threw starch in there as some crazy word um and that's why you didn't get any credit for that try to imagine a double helix of dna what's keeping those strands together and the answer like i said earlier or when we talked about it it's the hydrogen bond it's the weakest of the bonds um so the answer to that is it's the hydrogen bonds that keep the two strands together but as long as you picked any of the three bonds that we've talked about, hydrogen, ionic, or covalent, you at least got partial credit, and you did get partial credit. Um, what happens in transcription? And just to make it a little bit more challenging, I said put it in the reverse order. And the answer is termination, elongation, and initiation. But, you know, at least you got two out of the three correct. Yeah. So because of that, you got partial credit. So you got one out of two points instead of the full two points. Had you guessed... This, which has nothing to do with any of that, is just this is just garbage I made up. Had you guessed the garbage, you would have had zero credit, but you didn't guess the garbage. Gotcha. Um, transcription. Which of these things does transcription? Is basically what that's ask, answer asking, and the answer is RNA polymerase, right? Because transcription is the process of making RNA from a strand of DNA. So the answer is RNA polymerase. Had you guessed DNA polymerase, at least you'd have been on the right track and you would have had partial credit. But this other stuff is just garbage that I threw in there. Um, what enzyme did we discuss being used during S phase? In other words, what enzyme or what happens in S phase? We duplicate the DNA, right? So what enzyme duplicates DNA? It's in the name. And the answer is DNA polymerase. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And again, sort of like the last one. Had you chosen RNA polymerase, you would have had at least half credit. Um, but DNA polymerase is the correct answer. What would a mutation that results in an insertion of a premature stop codon do? So what does a stop codon do? A stop codon says stop making this protein, right? Stop adding amino acids. So if we have one that comes too soon, what would that result in? And the answer is it would result in a shorter strand of amino acids. However, at least you understood that it would make a shorter strand of something. So you got partial credit. 
But again, stop codons are what's used in translation. And translation is where we make, you know, polypeptides. It's where we make amino, it's where we're attaching amino acids to themselves. So that's why the answer is a shorter strand of amino acids. Huh. All right, which is in the correct order. Oh, this one breaks my heart. So anybody reading this, please, please don't miss this. Because as I was teaching this, I said, memorize this before you memorize anything else. This is so, so important, especially right now with so much fake, fake information going on about the COVID-19 vaccine. You need to know that it goes from DNA to RNA to protein. Please, please know that. That is so important. RNA protein. Okay. DNA, RNA protein. Yes. Very, very important. Memorize that before you memorize all this other stuff. Gotcha. Um, um, okay. Hold on. Let me try something else here. One second. I'm going to adjust my screen really quickly. Oh, you're good. If I zoom in. Ah. I'm trying to zoom in a little bit. It's not working. Anyway. Um, your cells have instructions on how to build proteins, which processes are involved in building the proteins, uh, proteins, put them in the correct order. Basically what I was just asking there. So when I say DNA to RNA to protein, basically that's saying, all right, what do we call it? Well, maybe you go from DNA to RNA to protein and we call it transcription when you go from DNA to RNA and then translation when you go from RNA to protein. So those are the only correct answers. Um, anything that didn't involve those two words would give you uh, less credit. But had you at least guessed those two words in the wrong order, you would have had partial credit. Yeah. All right. You have A's, T's, C's, and G's. All right. If your genome is 30% G's, then what percent is made up of T's? You got partial credit because at least your math kind of makes up sense, right? You need 100%, right? So 30 and 70 is a Yeah. So that makes sense, which is why you got half credit. But remember... Um, C's go with G's, right? So if you have 30% C's, that means you also have 30% G's, which means you have 60% C's and G's. Therefore, you have 40% A's and T's. And then you cut that in half for the T's, that means you have 20% T's. And they, if I had more time, gotcha. I, could, I could show you. But yeah, the answer to that is 20%. Um. How long is the thing in quotation marks? Oh, yeah. So how long is a codon? Simple answer. A codon is three letters long, right? That's oh, okay. That's just the answer. And had you guessed any number like you did, you get partial credit. If you guess this number, this weird name that I just made up, then you would have gotten zero credit. Um, all right. A nuclear bomb explodes. You have a mutation. Um, you substitute an A for a C. None of that matters. The important thing here is that the codon, even though you change the letters, the codon still codes for the same amino acid. So anytime you have a codon that codes for the same amino acid, that is what's called a silent mutation. However, we did talk about nonsense mutations, so therefore you got partial credit. Okay. Anybody who guessed some mutations were induced, that's that's they would have gotten zero credit because it doesn't ask that. It says, what kind of mutation is it? So... Um, so uh, chapter eight, the first one covered in this exam was about what, and that is just simply cellular reproduction. Which I hope people would get. How do you guess cellular? Uh, actually, no, they're all wrong. Okay, anyway, at least photosynthesis was the one from the uh, the, the previous exam. Yeah. Um, which of the following is in the correct chronological order? So the answer is prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Um, yeah, there's not much else to say about that. Prophase, metaphase. What's the last one? Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Gotcha. Okay. PMAT. Um, and Blake, what happened? To this? So this was asking basically what the difference between anaphase one and anaphase, uh, excuse me, anaphase one of meiosis and anaphase of mitosis. Oh, no, you chose the junk one. That's the uh, one that gets credit at least the rest of them it kind of made sense but the answer is homologous chromosomes separate an anaphase one of meiosis and sister chromatids separate an anaphase of mitosis so remember mm. in, in, in meiosis it's all about the homologous chromosomes in mitosis it's yeah sister chromatids gotcha genetic variation is accomplished by all of uh, all of which of the following and the answer is simply prophase two right because yeah we do get genetic variation from independent assortment. We get it from crossing over, which happens in prophase one. 
which happens in meiosis one. So the, that's why all of the prophase two is the only one that does not give us genetic variation. Yeah. All right. If a cell goes through the whole cell cycle except cytokinesis, what are you left with, right? And remember, cytokinesis is the part that actually splits the cell in two. So this thing's gone through all of mitosis. So the answer, the correct answer, is you would have more genetic material than you started with because you would have two uh, two nuclei in that one cell. Um, so yeah, there's not much else to say. That's why that is the correct answer. Mitosis in humans produce uh, typically produces what? And the correct answer is two genetically identical diploid cells, right? So we're talking about mitosis, not meiosis. But you got partial credit because you got two thirds of it right. Uh -huh. The two cell part and the diploid part, right? So because of that, you got partial credit. Um, similarly, meiosis in humans typically produces what? The simple answer is four cells. And yeah. Have, one, as you guessed, anything that had haploid and genetically unique, you would have had partial credit, but you had genetically unique, but the diploid. So again, you missed two thirds of the parts, so you didn't get any credit for that one. What do you call chromosomes that don't determine the sex of an individual? So when we were talking about chromosomes, we said there's basically two types of them. There's either autosomes or sex chromosomes. And so obviously the answer is autosomes. And um, on f yeah, yeah, that's it. Not much else to say about that one. Um, so the, don't worry about this. This is just to throw off the algorithm. It's because I know some people cheat, and I did this to throw off their app that helps them cheat. Mm -hmm. so, so really this question is asking, uh, what are the ingredients for chromatin? What is chromatin made of? And the answer is DNA, uh, so DNA and protein. Now, had you guessed RNA and protein, you would have had partial credit. But yours was uh, mitosis is not a noun, right? That's a verb. So mm. it's not made of protein, mitosis. All right. In the human life cycle, fertilization produces a diploid zygote. That's simply the correct answer. Yeah. Uh, we didn't mention anything about fetus, like, or at least not officially um, from the book. We didn't say anything about fetus or baby or child or adolescent or any of that. So that's why you didn't get any credit. But anyway, yeah. The answer is fertilization produces a diploid zygote. And I would talk more about that, but I just did a video with somebody else where I actually explained this. So okay. You can watch it if you want an explanation. Gotcha. And that's one of those weird ones where, like, again, I say, hey. Yeah. And that's, those are, I was always so confused with those. Now I get it now. Now you know. So, yeah, speaking of which. A big hint here, I've shared the exam, the final exam review from the previous semester. I've, I've shared them both. I highly recommend watching them if you get what I'm saying. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, and then the last thing before I let you go is make sure, if you don't mind, send me an email. to. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Okay, that'll help me. Again, I'll have a paper trail, and it'll remind me to give you the 10% the boost to each of those exams. Yeah, I appreciate it, definitely. And uh Hopefully I do much better on this one. I'm yeah. hoping so.